The following is a conversation with Ryan Jones of Jones Boys Loft in Utah. Ryan is a third generation pigeon fancier and goes into his history, his relationship with his dad and his grandfather. He goes into how he feeds and races his own race team and into how he prepares his birds for one loss. Ryan is also running for the Northwest Zone Director and goes into some of the things he'd like to see change and progress in the sport. I really appreciate Ryan's time. Thank you. All right, here we are with Ryan Jones, Jones Boys Ryan. Thanks for coming on. How are you? Good. How's it going today, Jeff? Good. <clears throat> so Good. you uh, you have your race season, old birds coming up here this weekend, right? So I talked to you this morning. You got a 100-mile training going on. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a good one this morning. Uh, 15 to 25 mile an hour headwinds. Oh, uh, day before shipping should be a good should be a good toss to set them up for the race. Well, good luck, and and uh, we'll have to keep tabs on how things are going with you on that. So we'll we'll dive into that for sure. So let's let's start at the beginning for you. Are you second generation pigeon fans here? Actually, third. Third. Yeah. Yeah, my grandfather and my dad. Uh, Started racing in 1961 here uh, in the Great Salt Lake. At the time, it was known as the Great Salt Lake Center and the Wings Club. Uh, my dad was too young to join the club as just a junior member and everything like that. Uh, as they did some pooling and auctions and stuff like that. Right. Uh, so they made my grandfather join. But uh, once he got in... No, he never missed a single race from 61 till we lost him in 1999 uh, while he was out training our birds. Oh, wow. Uh, him and his best friend were involved in a rollover accident. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, it's been a while ago, but yeah, it, yeah. just everything around the, <laughs> the pigeons, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So you grew up around the birds then. What? When did you kind of decide to have your loft and your team? Did you start out with kind of helping your dad? How did it begin for you? Oh, I started in the pigeon loft with my dad oh, as early as I can remember, really. Um, in the early 80s, my dad's loft was Ray Jones and son. Uh, my grandpa just flew with Ed Jones. Um, then... Oh, I would say when I was about eight years old, my dad had me start picking birds to pool as part of getting me more involved. So uh, I got to pick one bird a week and I could pool on it. And uh, fortunately, at the end of the year, I had the biggest bank account in the club. So <laughs> That's awesome. So you're spending time around the birds. You got to kind of know which ones you, you know, knew would perform on the day. Yeah, it was uh, it was a little different back when I was younger. I I swear I could see a an aura around the birds, you know, just the birds that were in super condition just looked different. And yeah, I would spend every afternoon when I got out of school. My job was to let the team out to law fly, flag them, bring them in, feed them, and I would spend oh a good hour every day after they came in, hand feeding them and just watching what they were doing and. Oh, yeah, it was a good time. I mean, back then we we had basically an Emil family. Uh, so a lot of silvers, white red grizzles, blue grizzles. It was fun. They were, they were beautiful birds, that's for sure. Yeah, I love spending time. I sit there and watch the birds and, uh, you know, you can tell a lot just by paying attention to their personalities as they age and you can tell when something's off or they're looking really good, you know, just their, their body language, their aura, as you said, uh, that's something that I think is important for people to hear because spending time with the birds, is the only way you can capture something like that. And obviously you're, you have a natural ability to be able to do that as a kid, but, um, it's important to spend time with the birds. Yeah. I saw your interview that you did with, uh, Rick Martis. And I really loved his comment about everybody needs to learn how to race pigeons. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Keep race pigeons. I thought that was a great, great comment. I mean, before you can really get into grading birds or 
really what you're looking for. Uh, you need to keep them and race them and let them show you what you're, what you're doing. Exactly. So are you, do you still have pigeons down the line from what you and your dad had when you were a kid that you've kept over the years or have you kind of shifted over time to a different type of bird? Yeah. In the, in the mid eighties, well, early to mid eighties, my dad, uh, went down to Whittier, California and visited a loft. Oh, the gentleman's name was Jack Henning and, uh, was introduced to our Husk and Van Real family at that point in time. Um, in fact, my dad brought back what became our foundation cock 0123's parents on that trip. Um, yeah, he was just blown away with the quality of pigeons uh, that were over there. And immediately when they hit our stock loft, I mean, they just started outperforming the, everything we had at that point in time. So it was a pretty fast transition moving along with that. Uh, my dad and my grandpa both flying all of the same birds out of the same stock off. My dad has always done all the breeding at his place. So, um, your grandfather and your dad had different locations they were at. Yes. Yes. We've all, uh, we all always flew from our own location. Well, when I was a kid, obviously living at my right. dad's, I, yeah, but, uh, once I bought my house in, uh, 1991, I mean, that was first priority within a month of living there. We <laughs> built a loft and, oh, I was getting ready to race pigeons. And that's still the location I race pigeons at today. So when your dad and your grandfather were flying in different locations, was this in the same club? Um, it was kind of funny. Originally, they were in the same club, but uh, my grandpa never left the original club that him and my dad joined when my dad was just 12 in 1961. So um, my grandpa stayed a member of the Wings Club. My dad moved on to what was known back then as the Pioneer Club and then the Beehive Racing Pigeon Club. And uh, when I started racing uh, from my location, then my dad and I both were in the Beehive Racing Club. And within... Oh, I'd say a year and a half. Uh, I got an invitation from uh, one of the premier clubs in our combine, the Salt Lake Invitational, to come join them. And uh, I did that. So the three of us were actually racing in three different clubs in the same combine. <laughs> wow. Well, what what was the competition like between the three of you then? Because you know, I have a lot of memories when I had my own loft and my dad had his own loft of racing against each other. There's that fun competitive, uh, you know, competitiveness we have with each other, but um, you know, you all being separate locations, but same combine was, was it fun to compete against them? Was there any sort of uh, back and forth, uh, you know, leading up to the race? Uh, what, what's, what was that like? Uh, we trained together and everything, which uh, I live quite West of my dad and my grandpa. Uh, they kind of live, on a similar flight line. So we raced from the north. And my grandpa was like 10 miles short of my dad, kind of on the same flight line. And uh, the first year that I flew, we were all training together and my birds were being released with theirs. And every week I was about five minutes out of the race because my birds would follow theirs along the east bench. And then, I mean, I could just basically look towards my dad's house and my birds would come straight from there. So, right. Uh, I learned pretty quick that uh, my birds needed to be released separately. So they would fly the, the line that they needed to once they right. hit the valve. But uh, as far as uh, talking and everything like that, so uh, my dad owned a two-bay Texaco service station, which we had made into a three-bay. And uh, Anyway, all of us worked together. My grandfather right. did books. My dad uh, was the individual that dealt with all the customers and everything, and I was a mechanic. So uh, it, every day was constant pigeon talk. And, uh, yeah, and then on race day, back then we had the – you remember you could get on, like, a party line, so you'd have multiple people on the phone and everything right. like that. That's, three of us would be talking all the time, if not uh, with several other club members. So, you know, 
back then pulling counter marks and everything. It was a it's a whole different game than it is now. Yeah, had to have your shoes tied tight and ready to go. Well, it, yeah, <laughs> and uh, it, you know it was definitely a lot more exciting clocking birds then. You know, I mean, now you just kind of walk down and get them in, and but bird never gets trap shy. Right back then, you get a bird that was hot and. After about the third time of you yanking on his leg, he was like, yeah, I don't think I want to come out of the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, being on the phone with those guys, it was awesome because week to week, uh, as we're clocking birds, we were clocking nest mates, full siblings and everything on the same races. So uh, it really helped evolve our breeding along quickly with the three of us racing all out of the same stock lot. Yeah, that's great. That gets you uh, your information quickly. Your your data gets uh, better and better as you race together like that. And to be able to share that with your grandfather and dad is pretty awesome. Sounds like uh, you guys are kind of, kind of you know pretty much rooting for each other and wanting to test the birds. And and it wasn't as you know you weren't too competitive with each other about it. Oh well, the first race is always right at your own loft. But yeah, it was high competition between us. I mean, definitely. Uh... Well, we bowled together, played pool together, <laughs> golfed together. You know, so it was always competition. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So <clears throat> what uh what what year were you did you say that you all were racing together when they're in that combine and everything? Uh basically from ninety two well, on to present. Uh like I said, we lost my grandpa in ninety nine, but uh yeah. And so at what point has uh, it changed for you? Uh, you know, what changes have you made to the operation? Um, what what kind of systems are you running now that you, you know, maybe be different than what you're doing then? Well, back then, uh, being the mechanic, uh, I worked 12, sometimes 16 hours a day. Um, and my wife did a lot of the work around our loft at home. So... Uh, I adopted the widowhood cock system during old birds. I feel that takes the least amount of effort for maximum oh, potential, you know, maximum uh, winning ability, I guess. Yeah, the <laughs> motivation. Well, I, not just motivation, but uh, the less time you spent with them, the better they performed. Really. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. So they just became their own individual in the loft. You get too close to the nest, you know, they'd, they'd bap you in the head and let you know that you were <laughs> in their space. Right. And my wife being the one that let them out every morning and every evening and let them back in and feed and was feeding them and everything like that. Boy, they uh, really reacted well to her being in the yard when they would come home. Yeah. They would clap at her. Uh, <laughs> Wait, if I went down to clock them, they absolutely would stand back. They'd wait for her to get down there before they jump in the stall trap. You know. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a good thing. I mean, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So what are you doing nowadays then with the system? Same thing, or have you changed it over time? So, oh, up until about 2017, I, I kept flying widowhood cocks in a separate loft but uh i had started also flying natural birds just no uh, when it was back with the three of us racing it wasn't such a big deal if i had nothing but champion cock birds you know what i mean uh because those guys were both flying all the hens and everything as well right so it's easy to keep a constant good flow of winning birds coming into the stock loft um when we lost my grandpa you know, became a lot more difficult on that side of it as my dad was the only one racing hens. So uh, I, I changed once my work schedule changed up and everything like that, I started racing natural. And then I loved the widowhood so much and had had so much success with it. I just kept aloft with, oh, like 10, 15 widowhood cocks each year. And then I would fly a natural team. And uh, with the widowhood cocks, I, uh, everybody get trained before the season, but uh, once races started, they were just locked out of the loft twice a day, so they were easy peasy. Yeah, 
<clears throat> they just exercise, do the pumping you're talking about, you know, get, uh, yeah. get the cuts shit. are, uh, they're, they're fun. Cause, uh, as they're coming into form, they really don't loft fly. Well, I mean, you gotta be a pretty patient person and enjoy your birds to fly it. Cause, uh, they do a lot of time milling around the loft. Yeah, exactly. They so, like to land and take off and land and take off and show off to each other. And it's just, it's a, it's a fun to watch. And like you said, when they're feeling really good, they're in good shape and in good condition. They, they just show you that when they pump off the loft and the way they act and everything, it's, it's real fun to see. Yeah. I, uh, I'd know when it was time to really start up in my pools when my <laughs> widow hit cocks would pop out of there, take off and, all of a sudden, they just start coming in like they'd all flown separately. You know, they wouldn't come back as a group. Every individual had a different direction. It'd take about 15 minutes for them all to come back to the loft and start playing king of the landing board again <laughs> before they took off again. Yeah, it's fun to watch. Um, so what kind of birds are you racing nowadays? What Where they come from and, and, and um, are you incorporating some of the stuff from the past? So that family, uh, our, we call it our, our 0123 HVR family. We're still breeding out of them, uh, keeping them very close. And uh, in the 90s, we brought in a family of Van Loons uh, from Hapico. I don't know if you remember the uh, Laverne Cock, mm -hmm. any of those. Anyway, uh, that's kind of where our base from our Van Loons came from. And then also I had acquired a, a whole inbred son of uh oh super 73 and 083 mm -hmm. so, anyways out of a brother sister mating full brother sister to bold ruler oh uh, and that those guys mixed together and then crossed with our hvrs is really what we flew uh, pretty exclusively until 2012 in 2011, we were at the AU convention race down in Arizona. And Scott McAllister and Dennis Branham had just brought in birds from Gaston Vandewer. In fact, the first Casbor birds that, that hit the United States at that point in time. Oh, he was just kind of a, just an up and coming racer over in Belgium. Right. And had met him, went over and bought direct sons and daughters of the Casbor. That's incredible. So when we were over at Dennis's, oh, we're good friends with Dennis Branham and oh, used to go down every year for the Arizona Open Classic. So we would always go over and spend a day just going through the loft and handling pigeons. And Dennis has got a fantastic group of birds. So it was always a real joy to go through and handle his pigeons. And my dad just couldn't say enough about how great these Casbor pigeons were. Anyway, I told Dennis uh, at the end of the weekend, hey, you ever get any of these that you want to sell, make sure you call me. Mm -hmm. Well, that summer, he called me up and said, hey, I put together two really special pairs. I, they're just eggs in the nest right now, but if you want them, you know, this is what I'm asking. And I said, absolutely, we'll take all four. Anyway, uh, Oh, later that year, we got the four birds, and they ended up being two nestmate pair of hens. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was pretty awesome. And immediately when we incorporated them into the breeding loft, so we took two of each and put with our band loons, two of them, and two of them with our HVRs. Well, Dad and I ended up with four birds each on our race teams. And, like, from this 100-mile toss, they immediately started out running our rest of our group by, like, five minutes oh wow it was like oh wow this is a super cross yeah yeah and then uh we really enjoyed having them and oh uh, one of our club members that we were training with all the time neil christiansen um he did a bunch of research on the pigeons because he wanted to get into the line as well i mean dad and i were having such good success and uh he dove into it and figured out that uh, he thought that uh, Gaston's real power came from his neighbor, um, 
de Belzer. So he purchased some direct imports from Johan de Belzer, and uh, we ended up acquiring those. And they really made another impact in the loft when we got them in in 2015. That's pretty much where we're at today is HVR Van Loon, Gaston Van Loon, and the Belzer Pigeons. That's great. Yeah, the, the Casbor has made impacts and a lot of loss, including mine. It's just great stuff to cross into bloodlines and uh, seems to really improve things. Um, what about uh, distance-wise are you flying with this old bird season that's coming up? What are you starting at and what does it end at? This year we uh, started a little shorter, or we're going to start a little shorter than normal. Usually our starting old bird race for me is 175 miles. This year it'll be 150. Um, but we race all the way out to a 600. So as far as we can go is the Canadian border to the north. And we literally release right at the Canadian border at uh, Sweetgrass, Montana. In fact, the, the exit says, this is your last chance to... <laughs> Not become a Canadian, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and do you but, have a do you have a distance in the one hundred and fifty to six hundred that you prefer? Do you try to do you try to breed an all distance pigeon that can do all those? Do you do you try to aim for some of your birds to do certain distances and others to do the distance? How do you kind of manage your team to take on all those distances? Well, I don't have a separate team for like one hundred and fifty to three hundred or three hundred and beyond. Everybody goes. If yeah. you're in shape, you go. And uh, I make my yearlings race five and 600 miles. Um, I really feel yearlings win races. Uh, old birds come home. Right. So I'm, I'm big time into racing yearlings. Um, I've had great success with two and three year olds. Don't get me wrong. It just yearlings don't know when to quit. Mm. If you the breakaway winner, it's usually a yearling. Yeah. Um, but all of our families fly all the way out to 600. Um, in fact, when we first acquired the the Casbor pigeons, Dennis Branham told me, well, don't expect these pigeons to fly five and 600 miles. Right. And the very following year, I won our 600-mile race <laughs> with baby out of one of the hens he sent us. And I was right. like, Dennis, these pigeons do it. Yeah. You know. I think that's a big difference between uh, what we do here in North America and, and what's done in Europe and, and Belgium and Netherlands is, you know, we, we want that all distance pigeon that can do one, 100 to 600 miles and be competitive. You know, a lot of the guys over there are more, spe you know, a lot of them specialize in certain distances and you have guys like Yellow Rogiers who's, you know, doing, you know, really well in young birds, doing really well middle distance, but also is now attacking long distance and having success and, um, you know, but I think that it takes a different kind of pigeon here to be able to do all distance and to be competitive at any distance you send them to. Oh, I think that I think we have a tremendous advantage, especially in the big one loft races all over the world when it comes to that. I mean, doesn't matter what the temperature, the distance is, the United States always competes well, if not, you know, winning the race overall. Right. So what's your morning routine with the race team now that you're leading up to your old bird season? What what are you doing? Uh, you know, you obviously you're training today. What are you doing, you know, during the week? What kind of uh, exercise are they getting? What kind of feeding are you doing? You know, what's the system that you have in place during the week and routine? Oh, I go light to heavy. So on Monday, they get 100% barley. Uh, Tuesday, I... Moved up about 50% barley, 50% champion. Uh -oh. Then Wednesday, it's pretty much champion as far as the feed goes versus Laga. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I roll into uh, Thursday with champion in the morning when they come home from the training toss with uh, the Geary. And evening is Geary and Energy Thursday, Friday day of shipping. Uh, morning feeding, just normal ration, 100% energy. Uh, but uh, um, what is Geary? Oh, uh, does it? It's the, does it go in the water and the feed, or it's more of an energy type feed? Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. 
Gotcha. I like it. Uh, my dad does uh, a little more champion than I do. So it's but, part of the uh, Versalaga mix. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's it's part of the Versalaga mix. Okay. Now I'm with you. Um, yeah. Sorry. I just that's what we feed is Versalaga exclusively. So yeah, yeah, and and a lot of a lot of people do. We do Des Moines feed here, so I'm not as familiar with the different uh, names of the Versalaga feed. But you're you're doing more of an energy mix towards the end of the week. Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah, I like it. Just uh, the birds go into the crate. You know what I mean? Uh, when you've got barley that you're feeding them mostly, you know how your droppings are. They get, well, their barley droppings are kind of sticky and everything like that. Yeah. I don't like to put my birds in the crate with that type of dropping. That's why I, I go light to heavy. Not only that, I think uh, just in preparation of, uh, of an athlete, kind of break them down and build them up. Break them right. down, build them up. Right. And so what type, are we doing products in the water at all? Um, I do a lot of natural stuff, just uh, apple cider vinegar, uh, along with, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, oregano type product. Uh, right. And uh, health guard. So I'll start out the week like Monday, Tuesday with the apple cider vinegar, uh, even into Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday with lemon, and also running the oregano and the health guard. Um, then Saturday on return, I put elderberry in with the oregano and health guard. And uh, Sunday, I usually let that run through with the elderberry. Then Monday back to the apple cider vinegar. Do you think the elderberry and, and apple cider vinegar combo kind of helps ba balance them back from the stress of the race? Uh, I think the elderberry does. I mean, back in the day, I used to use electrolytes and vitamins and glucose. And uh, I spent a lot of money on the poop that I would shovel out of the loft. So, right. um, I've totally gotten away from electrolytes 100%. Uh, I just don't feel that the bird, that our birds really digest them and uh, utilize everything out of that. I've not seen any difference since I quit using them as far as recovering and everything like that. The only thing I do notice is that I have a lot less runny droppings not using electrolytes. Sure, okay. And uh, grit-wise, are we using Versalagas all-in-one? Is that what it is? All in one. And then uh, they've also got their other grit, uh, which I add in oyster shell and uh, red salt. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I big time grit on day of exercise. So like today, they're coming home to all in one and a lot of salt. Uh, I think. And I never take the grit away. I mean, I don't give them brand new grit on day of shipping, but. The day before when they come home from the training toss, yeah, they, they've got all the all-in-one that they want to go through, which is funny. They love it. It's like candy. Yeah, and I, I've uh, used Javati grit, with, and I mix it with several other kinds, but I've, I've ordered uh, some of the all-in-one Versalaga to mix into that as well, and so that should be here today or tomorrow, so I'm, I'm excited to try it, but uh, I've heard a lot of great things about it. Yeah. Yeah, the, I like it a lot. Uh, I like the Versalaga products. I, I think the, there's nothing in them that the birds can't just naturally digest and, and get 100% use out of them. I think a lot of the grains that we use here in the United States uh, have a lot of fill in it. You know what I mean? Just Yeah, yeah, right. Them up, but there's not a lot of usable protein or, uh, you know, nutrients out of it. Where are you getting? Where do you get all your Versalaga products? Do you order it from somewhere? Um, right now, I'm getting it direct from their location in Florida. Um, uh, being an ambassador for them, I'm fortunate enough that they send me a pallet every year. So uh, it's kind of where we get the base of it. And then uh, as I go through the year, if I need something, I just get it off of Chewy. Got it. So... <clears throat> 
what are you doing the day of basketing? Are you doing any motivational techniques? Do you leave them be? And, and, and you know, what are you doing uh, on day of basketing? So now I'm just racing natural. I don't do anything really. I don't do anything motivational. Uh, they pretty much got set. I try to keep up with them as far as where they're at with, uh, you know, nest position and everything like that. I definitely do not like to send a driving cock. Uh, I think it's disaster, <laughs> especially yearling driving cocks. Um, obviously, hens you need to pay close attention to. You don't want to send them when they're going to be getting eggy, right? You know, driven too hard or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I just uh, as long as they're not eggy or driving and aren't injured, they're going to the race. What about I, the morning feeding? Do you do the morning feeding, afternoon feeding? How do you feed them going up to going in the basket? So right now, pretty much all week long, because I've got to be to work at uh, 7 a.m. So the feed gets dumped in during the dark. So when they get up, they've got feed. Um, then when I get home from work, uh, Monday through Wednesday, then I let them out to loft fly. Uh, if I need to, I'll flag them. Although, like right now, they're feeling so good and everything like that. Uh, I'm usually throwing droppers after two hours, trying to get them back in. Right, right. Some reason that uh, three o'clock in the afternoon is right in the transition where cocks are going to be getting off the nest anyway. Hens are going to be getting on. So they all want to go out and really fly during that time. It's like, oh, no, it's your turn to be on the nest. No, it's yours. So nobody's like hounding you to come in. Um, it's worked out well. Right. But Fridays, I, I really would prefer to feed at the time that I feel like the birds are going to arrive on Saturday and just feed once. But uh, the way my work schedule is now, I'm, I just feed them all I want, basketing, Friday morning. Um, then I try to give it at least two hours before basketing, give them some more feed. Uh, I'm not somebody that ever holds it back. <laughs> sure. Uh, our family of pigeons, uh, they kind of maintain themselves. They don't ever tend to overeat. So, yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, there's, you know, going to be a lot of people watching that have similar schedules that aren't going to be able to be there at certain times where they're working and stuff. So people definitely like hearing that, that what, what they can do to adjust with their schedule. Oh, yeah. And the birds will always adjust to what you Put them through. You know what I mean? It's just uh, you need to be routine with what you're doing once you start it. Uh, one thing I would suggest to anybody, especially new guys that are just starting out in the sport, don't mid-season make a, an extreme change. You know yeah, what I mean? Uh, right. You got to kind of get a plan together, get it set, and stay regimented with it and go. Um, anybody uh, that would like – I. I put together a basic feeding and training watering program um, that I send to any newbie that's starting with us that is interested in it, just to kind of give them a base where to start. Um, obviously, as you go along, you're going to adjust and find what works, you know what I mean? But this is a great foundation just to immediately come in and start being competitive. And you can run it off of your time schedule. Doesn't have to be off of mine, just whatever. So, if uh, people watching want to get a hold of you to to get that, is that where, where can they contact you directly? Is there a website? What are you? <clears throat> um, I don't have a website, but they can contact me directly. Um, my phone number is 801 971 3586. Obviously, I'll, you know, they can text whatever, and then I'll give them my email address and I'll just forward that stuff on. Perfect. So if they want to get a good start <clears throat> on how to feed and take care of the birds, you can send them that. And you can also probably help them if they're interested in the Versa Lager products, being an ambassador, you can kind of help, help yes, get started absolutely. with that. Uh, Perfect. Get them at the point of contact over here in Florida and everything like that. Yes. Great. Um, let's move into what your kind of pigeon is. What characteristic traits are you looking for in pigeons when you put them in your hands? Is there something you like to feel? Is it more pedigree based what what do you do to analyze a bird maybe you're in an auction or or uh, you know handling birds 
with someone else and you're looking to acquire or, you know, maybe just evaluating your own birds, what are you looking for? What do you like? Oh, number one thing I like is feather condition, feather quality. Um, I like a, a bird that the feathers are always so nice and perfect that you have a hard time holding on to it. It just wants to slide right through your hand. Right. Yeah. That's uh, like this. I, yep. And I, I feel that feather quality is highly underlooked. Uh, everybody's after that nice big muscle or, you know, whatever. And uh, I also feel that, uh, you know, you need to be able to look at that wing. Part of the feather quality is how flexible those flights are. Um, it's where they generate their power. You know what I mean? It's just like uh, a golf club. If you've got a stiff steel shaft, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then it, it takes that hard swing to get now. Uh, the torque you know, club speed up. Yeah. Right. If you've got something that is nice and flexible, I mean, it doesn't take as much effort to generate twice the speed. So, right. Uh, I'm really into that. Uh, obviously, we all love a well balanced pigeon that just fits in your hand. Nothing that like wants to drop out the front or, you know, pops up in the back. But uh, I've had a lot of great pigeons that are plenty athletic, you know, that, that butt end moves around a lot. Uh, and really what I'm looking for is, uh, the first tail poking out of the lot, you know, uh, first tail through the trap. So yeah, I love, I love great looking eyes, um, with a lot of grit and granulation, uh, peaks and valleys in it. You know what I mean? When you're looking at the eye, I like right. a lot of that movement <clears> of the eye. I think is very important uh something that brad laburn uh was a big advocator of is if a pigeon had to always move its head to follow you in the loft it was not as high a quality as one that could literally move its eye and follow you without having to move its head so if you find that bird that you can take and the pupil actually follows you instead of the head you've really found something there i'm sign of intelligence do you think i do yeah that makes sense do you have a important lesson that you've learned in caring for the pigeons maybe a moment where you you know something happened and you you know you said okay that that's something that you know i can improve on you know i'm you know new flyers uh, uh, you know since i've been doing these interviews they want to hear some of the kind of trial and error people have gone through. Do you have any moments like that, that you've the lesson you've learned? Oh yeah. Uh, don't overuse products. I mean, back in the day, like I said, when I was younger uh, and using products, I mean, Oh yeah. If a tablespoon of glucose is good, five tablespoons is going to be great. You know what I mean? That type of thing. Uh, there's no magic potion that makes these guys go. In fact, a, the heavier you get into different products and everything like that, you're going to hurt your pigeons. Uh, be really careful with antibiotics and medication. You can way overdo it and uh, you know start hurting organs in the pigeon. Uh, you know, never do more than what is on the label. So if it says half a teaspoon at the max, be given half a teaspoon, maybe a little short of that. Right. And watch what you're putting in with that medication, because if you're, uh, you know, you may be increasing the potency of your medication or whatever you're using if you're using other products. And, you know, since we're already kind of diving into advice for new flyers, what, what other advice do you have for someone who's just starting out, um, you know, or guys that maybe are coming back after a break? What would you do if you're kind of starting over? Uh, like I said, stay <laughs> consistent. Don't go, oh, my birds aren't coming. I need to scrap everything I'm doing. And, you know, I'm going to quit flying to the perch and I'm going to fly Widowhood. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to yeah. mid-season. I'm going to change what I'm doing and do this because right now the birds aren't coming. Boy, uh, I mean, 
I did that a few times. In fact, thinking I was being smart, getting ready for the money race, you know, go, oh, yeah, how the birds are coming good to the perch. Now, if I just separate the sexes, you know, they'll really come good because they'll get yeah. all excited getting together. Right. Yeah, and you go from being here on the sheet to ugh, yeah, immediately down. I mean, it, it takes a while with every system for the birds to get in tune with it and get going. So the first thing that you're going to do when you change up what you're doing is go down the sheet before you, it, it's going to take weeks before you ever make that climb and, and see a difference in the change other than negative. <laughs> right. That makes sense. That's good advice. Um, so get a plan before the season starts. You know what I mean? I, I like to pretty much write a map for almost every bird. Literally, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I've lumped it into more just the team. But uh, like when I flew with a hood cox, I mean, I had a, a plan for every pigeon, you know. So try to get a plan together before the race season starts and and then just go with it. Yeah. And I think that's important for new people, too, is to not have an overwhelming amount of birds to where you can have a plan for each pigeon. Because if you're flying, you know, some of these guys start out with over 100 birds on their team and it's hard to manage that. Um, you know, whenever you're a new new flyer, as you get more experience, you can increase the number of birds you have. But you know, to in order to have a good plan and to take the notes and to have a you know, uh, good uh, establishment to begin with, you got to have you know, a manageable number. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you know, the other thing that I would uh, recommend to people is kind of contrary to that is uh, definitely as you're starting out. Find the number that you're able to care for and condition and try to increase that as you're moving along, you know what I mean, year to year. Just right. uh, so you're testing as many birds as possible, you know what I mean, so you're able to find out how your breeding's working. Right. Um, so if you're down to six pairs, then take – five rounds out of those guys, you know what I mean? Or whatever you can do to, to pump that and find out how many, you know, what your percentage is, what you're working with. Um, find a breeding pair that 50% of the babies are doing well on. You should stay on that pair. You know right. what I mean? If they're, if one out of 10 is a good one, you need to move on from that pair, you know? Right. And that's all comes back to having that data that you're, you're, accumulating your data you're paying attention again going back to the beginning what we said you got to spend time with the birds you got to pay attention right and yes yeah i think that's great let's move into one loft you all have had a lot of success at the one loft uh what what's the process for you on selecting birds that go out to one lofts and you can also kind of give us a little bit of you know some of your accomplishments in the one loft racing and on all that um so my dad and i both fly our young birds just to the perch. Uh, no lighting, no darkening, um, just like they would be in a one loft race. In fact, uh, we're a little more hardcore than that. Uh, I know the one loft race is all, we'll cut and pull flights. I don't even do that. Uh, most I do is I, I pull tail feathers um, and so I just feel it, it helps spark the immune system. But I usually do that uh, when I'm shipping the birds to a one loft race, too. I'll pull the two very outer on each end and the very two center. So they've still got six tail feathers there when they get to the one loft race they're going to. But two outer on each side and the two very center, they're gone. Right. So, and it, I mean, like I said, I think it's a, now oh, the old guys when I started flying, that was a, if you ever had a problem with your pigeons, you know, that was the first thing you did is start pulling tail feathers because it'd kick in the immune system. You know, it, back then, nobody used anything, but I think m -tril. So it was like, did you give it a pinch of m <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Then pull the tail feathers. If that didn't fix it, pull some tail. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's always kind of just stuck with me. In fact, I shouldn't say always. I had totally forgot about that. Until 2015, when I was handling for the um, AU convention race here in Utah, and 
oh man, I'm telling you, mixing all those birds from all over the country and everything like that. And I had never seen Circo, Adino, whatever it was. And uh, that was that was a eye opener. I uh, had birds kind of dropping over and, you know, walk into the loft, everybody looked great. The next day you'd walk in and there'd be feet everywhere. They were throwing up and filling themselves with water. And I didn't really know how to react to it. Uh, you know, and everybody's like, oh, give them this medication, give them this medication. And really one of the old guys reminded me in the club, he's like, why don't you just pull their tail feathers out? And I went through, literally went, oh, yeah. yeah. So I went through my whole team and just started pulling tails. And really, I feel like that was the saving point right there. Uh, everybody immediately snapped around. It's kind of funny. Uh, for the next month and a half, as I was letting them out, the, I had a team of bats because <laughs> no tail yeah. feathers. They, they could fly, but they couldn't stop. So they were all landing on the ground. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Having to kind of get used to that for a little while while they grow them back. Well, that's interesting. Anyway, sorry, I got a that's, that's little. Unique. I got a little off base there, but for the one lot races, we uh, we take our young birds, fly them to the perch. Um, then, with both of us flying, we uh, take which are the hottest pairs that we're breeding out of, and those are the pairs the following year that we're going to send to the one loft races. Um, I feel like you need to know what you're sending to the one loft race. It needs to be proven. You need to know that it's going to fly. Um, just taking a great pigeon from John Jaropoulos and Joe Namelka and putting them together doesn't make great pigeon. You know what I mean? It can. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but uh, you're, you're gambling a lot harder than somebody that's proven their birds out, you know, racing them week to week and making sure that they can – do a five race series and uh, what speeds they're doing well at. And, you know, that the pair that they're coming from is performing at a high percentage. So <clears throat> is there anything physically, physical characteristics you're looking for in the birds you're sending out? Is there a certain size that you like, or is it more about the parents and, you know, the production of the parents? Uh, I like uh, the siblings that I'm going to send out to the one loft races to handle like the one that have performed performed yeah. Us. yeah you know what i mean uh yeah. i'm not uh particular about the size i mean i i like a middle you know mid-sized pigeon um i don't like real small sparrow pigeons and uh i don't like a great big guy but uh when they win i mean i've had oh, some pretty larger cockbirds that have done very very well um and i've had some smaller hens that definitely have performed well, but I like that mid-sized pigeon. I mean, just if I'm going to spend $500 per bird, you know what I mean? Between the perch fee and entry fee and everything like that, I want it to be as perfect a pigeon as I can put in that crate. So right. that quality has to be great. Um, health has to be fantastic. Uh, you know, needs to be full bodied. And I feel like the immune system needs to be engaged and going. You know what I mean? So we usually vaccinate now 10 days before, at least mm -hmm. 10 days before putting them in the shipping crate. Um, I really like more like two weeks, but. Mm -hmm. And what are you vaccinating for? Um, so just recently we uh, started using the Adeno Circo PMV. It's one that uh, comes from uh, Europe. Anyway, that's the uh, that's the young bird vaccine that we've been using. And then every year before our old bird now uh, breeding season, we go through and uh, vaccinate for paratyphoid, that type of stuff. You know, the combination that I think everybody uses. Yeah, this the pre-breeding to make sure everyone's healthy and ready to go to breed healthy youngsters, kind of get them ready for that. Yeah, come uh, the 1st of November, we go through, so right after our young bird season's over, we go through all the breeders, vaccinate, and then uh, 28 days later, we go through and do it again, you know, give a boost. Great. And what, what about some of the accomplishments in the one loft that you participated in? Oh, uh, we've, we've had some pretty uh, good success over the years, that's for sure. Uh, 
We've had some all alone breakaway winners at one loft races, uh, like the spring break, the old Highlander one loft race, just recently the high desert. Those are always exciting and fun. You know, when you get a bird that's uh, 20, 30 minutes out in front of the the group of birds that shows up next. Right. Yeah. Um, we've had the great fortune of having won the San Diego Holiday Classic multiple times. Um, the Triple Crown, the old San Diego Triple Crown race uh, used to be one of our favorites. Uh, many times were we in the first drop of the finale of that, which the old Triple Crown, they would fly the 100-mile race on Monday, 200-mile race on Wednesday, and 300-mile race that same week on Sunday. I mean, same pigeons going back to back to back 600 yeah. miles in one week. It was yeah. uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, the, uh, we've been very fortunate uh, over the last, what, eight years to have won the, the spring break um, several times. I think it's like five times now been in the first drop of the finale over there in the last eight years, something like that. And the high desert is a yearling race, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and I think since you really race your yearlings hard and you you know, you know send them out to distance, you're really able to get a lot of good data there to see what kind of yearling it takes, right? Well, it's kind of funny. It's a yearling race, but uh, we also don't put birds in uh, that loft until August. Yeah, so, that's true. That's true. You know, by the time that they – they're still young birds. Yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah. Uh, but – I do, I do agree with you. Like the spring break is more of a yearling type of a race. Um, again, we don't send birds to it until July, but it's just kicking off and flying right now. Um, yesterday they flew the 235. We were fortunate enough to have two of our eight in the first drop. Awesome. So, yeah, it, it's yeah. And when uh, Eddie Spetz used to run his Fast Eddie's Late Hatch Classic, uh, we had really good success at that one. So the earlier races, uh, young bird one loft races, we probably don't have as much success with, but, um, my father and I also don't put our breeding team together until Valentine's day. My dad's pretty traditional about that. So, um, we don't do really any early breeding. Mm -hmm. Recently I have, uh, made six individual breeding, uh, pens in at my house. And uh, this year is only the third year that I've been doing like six special pairs. And uh, we've seen some good success out of that as well. Um, you know, with the earlier one loft races, just having put the breeders together earlier. Is it pretty cold where you are at that time of year? Oh, yeah. But a lot of guys, uh, uh, I mean, they're band of birds come January 1st. So yeah, right here, but yeah, we have, we got full on winners, um, you know, a week or two of below freezing for certain. And yeah, we get all four seasons here. Yeah, that's for, for sure. sure. Yeah. The big advantage that we have right here in our area is we have an extremely dry climate. So we don't have to worry about a lot of things like pox, you know, uh, other diseases that are carried by bugs and stuff like that. Uh, you just don't see a lot of it. Right. <clears throat> well, let's get into your, uh, you're running for the Northwest Zone Director for the AU. What's uh, your goals with that? What What are you wanting to get into that? And what are you hoping to be able to accomplish? A hundred percent. I want to get uh, the AU really making a push to promote our sport. Um, I, I feel like right now we're just comfortable sitting there uh, with the membership that we've got. Um, I, I don't know about you, but every time I'm anywhere and pull out my pigeon crates, you know, training, people are like driving over, what are you doing? You know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the things I'd like to really implement is a uh, getting all of our trailers, be it a training trailer, your combine trailer, club trailer, whatever, get something on the back of it that shows the AU with the national number 
and even put the local club contact number on there because when that's rolling down the road, everybody's like, what is that? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? I want to get involved with that or right. I want to know what's happening. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, I'd like to see stuff like that. Uh, really, that's my big thing is the sports promotion and and anything that we can do to help map and guide somebody that's starting out. I mean, we've got a guy that's just starting out. Uh, in fact, he's flying old birds. He's only got seven birds on his team right now. And he's talked to all the guys that are in his club, which is just 20 miles down the road from me. And he's like, eh, they're a little helpful, but nobody will really help. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, <clears throat> so... Yeah, I, I think we all need to work a lot more on being an open book. And there's really no secrets to this sport other than once you learn how to keep your birds and keep them healthy, you're really going to enjoy it a lot more. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we're doing that. And I don't think there's any magic pill that you give them that makes them better. I don't feel like uh, it, you're – a feeding system, uh, I've heard a hundred different feeding systems of really successful flyers. I think whatever works for you and what you feel good with and is, you know, is, is functioning and working, then great, it's going to work. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if somebody came and started flying in our area and flew Frank McLaughlin's Heavy Delight, I think they'd have just as much success, you know, if they have great pigeons and everything as – yeah as anybody else that's even like to heavy. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the big issues with, with new guys or guys that maybe have been in it a little while, but are looking to improve is people want to not talk and, and, and not give them advice. One thing I'm always uh, have said is that you can copy everything that I do, but when it comes down to it, I'm going to put in that extra work and I believe in my birds and, you know, let the, let the best pigeon win. Um, so I, that's one of the things new flyers and guys that are kind of getting started uh, really appreciate about these interviews is guys like you coming on and explaining what you do and being open to communication to help people. And that's getting some people like that into the zone director positions, I think, is, is awesome. Uh, our trailer for our Northeast Oklahoma Federation uh, has that AU symbol on the back and it says racing pigeons in transport and has a phone number and we're we're trying to do that as well. Um, I did a interview with Ken Crater and we were talking about one of the ways to improve club flying and, and getting people excited. Uh, we here in Northeast Oklahoma, uh, Texas, Louisiana, uh, Missouri, and I think Tennessee is going to be joining us. We have the, what's called the Texas open. We released from Jacksonville, Arkansas. So for me, it's like 230 miles. For guys in Texas, it's 300. I think Tennessee will be 300-ish. But it's a massive release. Right, Compass. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so what Ken was suggesting, that the AU have AU open. So for you, it could be the Northwest AU open. And for, you know, uh, someone in the Plains, it can be a Plains open. It can, you know, the Southeast could have one. The Northeast could have one. Then what you have there is a Belgian style national release where you have multiple states competing against each other. And then the AU could um, promote it on the website of the top 10 birds or whatever. We, you know, that's just an example, but you could promote the, the birds that win to promote the fancier, you know, talk to them about what the, who, you know, who the bird is and, and the pedigree and, and how they prepared the birds for the race. And I think it would get a lot more engagement. It would get a lot more excitement because I think, as you probably know, in young birds and old birds every year, you're racing against mostly the same type of people. And so a, a big open race like that kind of allows you to expand who you're racing against and have a big, exciting uh, ra race every year. And so I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on something like that, if you think that's something that, you know, could help with the club racing. I do. Um, I, In fact, right now, uh, I don't like – in the Midwest, uh, they've got the Topeka, which everybody races for. Um, I don't know if you fly the Topeka or not. I do not, no. Yeah, everybody I know in the Midwest, is like, that's the big race, and it's a right. compass race. I mean, birds are going everywhere. They've got uh, everything from 100 mile out to 600 mile. Now, you know, 
distances anyway and they're flying back to colorado or flying to chicago <laughs> right um here in utah uh we have the western open that's released in nevada so like for me it'd be due west um i think a lot more advertisement and uh a promotion of those type of things will help the sport uh these races have been going on for a lot of years. I just don't think they get enough acknowledgement. Yeah, enough awareness and, and advertising. Exactly. To, right, to make it a big benefit. Um, like our, our combine has tried multiple times to fly the Western Open, and then the weather gets funky or something changes, or and, uh, you know, then it's just canceled. And it's like, oh, we spent all that time getting birds prepared to go – off of our course, you know, and then nobody wants to try it again the next year. Right. That makes sense. Um, one thing that we are doing right here, uh, a brand new race that was just started up, it'll be this Young Birds, but uh, it's a race from the West, and it's open to everybody that flies in our Wasatch Concourse, which uh, our Wasatch Concourse basically goes from, like, Downey, Idaho, all the way through Santa Quin, Utah. So it's about, oh, uh, 200 miles in from north to south. And uh, we're going to have a race from the west this year. And just about every loft will be within 10 miles of each other as far as total distance, but spread out over 200 miles of a front. That's cool. And uh, that'll be two weeks after our young bird season is over. And like I said, it's been open to everybody. So, uh, and now uh, Alan Meacham and Dick Bazio that have kind of headed up this race, uh, they've been in contact with Mike Gannis, um, Jim Ward, and uh, some other guys. I mean, that's who I remember on the flyer, those two exclusively, but uh, they're donating birds. So whoever wins the race will get, you know, an excellent pigeon from a top breeding loft and everything yeah. like that. That's great. Yeah. I know that uh, the new guys who are starting around us are super excited about that. Yeah, that absolutely. Um, do you, is there anything else you want to touch on with the North Rest, Northwest direct, uh, Zone Director? Um, I definitely, guys, get out and vote. That would be the big thing that uh, I would say. Um, yeah, the current Northwest Zone Director, Jeff Life, is a great guy. Uh, he and I are good friends. Uh, in fact, when we just had our combine show and auction back in November, he was out of my house and uh, we all hung out, talked to pigeons, maybe had a few uh, adult beverages until mm -hmm. late in the evening. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, get out and vote. That's for sure. And get involved with our sport. And that's the big thing is. Yeah. If we're not all involved and we're not all promoting and pushing and helping people, it's going to cease to exist. And that'll be a sad day that we Absolutely. can't just go on club race. I mean, I would hate to see <clears throat> sport fall to literally just breeding pigeons and sending them to a one-off race. That, To me, once you lose the enjoyment of it in your own backyard, that excitement of those birds coming home and everything week to week uh, – yeah, I, I just don't think it's the same. You know, uh, one loft racing is exciting, and I've been at a lot of the one loft races that we've won, and it's fun. But uh, like the first time I had a 600 mile day bird, nothing will beat that experience. Yeah, I'm with you. The the flying in your own backyard, the feeling of accomplishment, uh, all your hard work those early mornings driving down the road, those mornings scraping your loft and preparing your birds, feeding them, buying all the products, you know, as far as top quality feeds and grits, all that coming together for you to do well on race day. There's no rush like that. And um, I enjoy one lofts as well. And it's fun to be there in person, especially the social side of it. But, Absolutely. Uh, but to me, there's nothing that compares to that feeling of being, uh, in your yard you know watching your birds give it their all coming home and it's that you're, you're you're in sync with your birds 
in their performance. And it just, it's, it's an incredible feeling. So I'm with you. And that's one of the reasons I started doing this is to try to raise awareness and help people and try to help grow things a little bit to where uh, it doesn't go away because, you know, I'm 36 years old. I still have a lot of years left and, and racing and I want to, I want to see it continue. So I'm really uh, appreciative of guys like you that are willing to step up and run for something like this Northwest zone director and, and, Hope people get out and vote. And uh, I really am excited to see some of this uh, positive change and more awareness heading towards uh, that. That's awesome. So I appreciate you. Oh, you bet. And and like I say, if you vote for Jeff or you vote for me, I'm good with either way. Let's just keep let's keep it moving. You know, yeah. I mean, keep moving forward. And I think uh, uh, whoever's in place now, if they've been there for 10 years or so, Maybe it's time for some new ideas and some new blood to get in there. You know sure. what I mean? Uh, just like our regular politicians, I'm sure that all of us would love to see our senators be replaced every eight years instead of uh, the same guy being there for 40 years. Right. You know, getting nothing done type of yeah. thing. Not that the guys that are there are doing nothing. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. It's just, you know, we need fresh to ideas, new things. new paths to try. Yeah, we, we we need to continue to grow. I get it. Um, final question for you. Do you have a proudest moment, your favorite moment in racing that maybe it's something with your grandfather and your dad? I don't know. Maybe it's something that you know, like your 600 mile day bird you're talking about. Do you have a moment that sticks out to you that you'll never forget? Well, oh, uh, that the 600 mile day bird, my first 600 mile day bird was, uh, is probably my, oh, uh, most exciting point of being in the pigeon racing, that's for certain. In fact, uh, oh, the day that that happened, uh, it was 90, 90, 95 degrees on the summer solstice. Um, 25 mile an hour headwinds at my place. Um, so as I was talking to my dad and my grandpa, in fact, uh, both those guys were convinced that there was no way that we were going to get birds. Uh, actually, Sorry, my grandfather passed away at that point in time. <laughs> I, flew, I flew so many races that he was around. Yeah, there. yeah. Anyway, I, my dad was convinced that there was no way we were getting birds. And uh, I actually was talking to, on the telephone with uh, one of our old flyers, Joe Coletti, who was yeah. the master of the 600. If uh, my dad and my grandpa weren't going to win the 600 as I started in, it was going to be Joe Coletti. Anyway, he was a club member. Uh, in the SLI with me and he and I were talking on the telephone and uh, I could see my bird coming from a distance. In fact, the wind was blowing so hard. He would drop down on the ground and as he would come up over a neighbor's house, I'd just see him rise up over their house and then back in their backyard and coming over the next street, same thing. And I mean, anyway, I was talking to Joe Coletti on the phone. And I said, Oh my God, Joe, I think I'm getting a bird. And I'm like, Oh my God, Joe, I am definitely getting a bird. And as he came in, I was like, oh, it's 1110. It's my auction bird. It's my pick bird. It's my pool bird. And uh, anyway, I run down. He hits the landing board. He was as fresh as the minute I sent him. I swear he didn't look spent at all. Anyway, hits the landing board, and I'd thrown a dropper, little hand down there on the landing board. I'm pushing him in like it's a 100-mile race, and we've only got <laughs> nanoseconds to get in. And he stops and looks at me. Just <laughs> looked aside, <laughs> topped the little dropper head, and then walked in. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. But uh, great the guys that uh, were literally seventy-five miles short of me were just clocking at the same time. So wow. I had the only bird within fifty miles at the end of the day, um, and I ended up with the second bird in our uh, county. In, and in the combine, in the Great Salt Lake combine, and I didn't clock him until 8.30 the following morning. Wow. Well, that's quite the accomplishment. That's It was fun. Uh, yeah. The big one, uh, when my dad and my grandfather and I were flying, so it was uh, I, the third year I was, fourth year I was in racing, fourth year. Um, we won. So at the time we were flying as my grandpa was first generation Jones. My dad was second generation Jones and I was third generation Jones. That's what our loft names were. And uh, my grandfather won 
long average speed first. My dad was second, and I was third. That's in our combine of uh, you know fifty plus members at that point <laughs> in time. So that was that was. Yeah, that's awesome. One of those crowning achievements, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, the three of us. <laughs> and, and the funny thing are, uh, the loft behind me, the next closest guy was two hours back. And my dad and I and my grandpa were all within 10 minutes of each other. That's so awesome. So it came right down to that last race, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've really enjoyed hearing your stories. I especially enjoy hearing about your grandfather and your dad and your all's relationship. That's special. Uh, I really enjoy and appreciate the times I get to spend with my dad with the birds. And I I get it. I know, I know how uh, special it is and important it is. So I really appreciate you sharing all that. I appreciate your advice to new flyers and and your willingness to discuss your what you like to do with your birds and wish you nothing but the best with this old bird season coming up and we'll have to have you back on and discuss how it went and maybe some new yeah. things that you learned and and uh, just continue the conversation absolutely and i know that you've just started your old bird season in fact i didn't see your week two results but it looked like you did very well the first week out so yeah we we've had a couple of yeah, we've had a couple of good starting weeks. This past weekend was 224 miles, and we won our federation in the A race, which is five birds, and we won our federation in the B race, which is unlimited. And uh, my wife has her own team, and she she got me by like 0.5 seconds in the A race. And then, yeah, she got me, and she is happy about that. And then uh, yeah. I was able to take home the B. But our federation is very tough, so we were very proud of our birds. And, and uh, you know, it was a good 200-mile good race for us, 224 miles. So we're – we're uh, early in the season, but I'm like you. I, I like those long distance races where it's kind of a mystery. You're watching the sky because it's kind of a mystery as to when you might get a bird. And so really looking forward to, to the distance this year. And uh, so, yeah, so good luck to you. Let us let us know uh, how it's going and we'll have you back on. And, and uh, good luck to you with the Northwest Zone Director. And where can people reach out to you? I know you gave your phone number earlier, but you're on Facebook. I am on Facebook. Uh, I don't have a website, uh, but you can email me at R-A-Y-J-S-I-N at gmail.com. Um, that's Ray J Sin at gmail.com. Like I was saying, we had a Texaco Sinclair station. That yeah, was uh, cool. really, that's been my email address since we were Ray Jones Sinclair <laughs> yeah. when AOL started. Yeah, yeah. The old dial up. Yeah, so. old dial up. <laughs> yeah and one more time phone number just in case someone wants to reach out for some of the other uh stuff we discussed yeah it's 801-971-3586 and uh yeah that, i mean i do work a full-time job but uh i i try to get back to anybody and everybody that messages me and calls leaves a message whatever and uh oh, usually in the evening time and uh I, i'm an open book there's I have no secrets with the pigeon racing. It's uh, 100%. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, hopefully what you want to know. <laughs> um, if I don't know it, I know enough people in the sport uh, that I'll find out. Exactly. That's you know, awesome. I mean, we'll, we'll, get your, we'll get your question answered for certain. Awesome. Well, Ryan Jones, Jones Boys, I appreciate you coming on. Good luck with the upcoming season and uh, with the Northwest Zone director and all that. So uh, thank you again for coming on. Well, thank you for having me, Jeff. And yeah, I look forward to having a follow-up. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Bye, buddy. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.